Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. Last week, to celebrate passing half a million subscribers, I set myself the ambitious goal of analyzing Queen's magnum opus, and arguably the magnum opus of the entire 1970s rock scene, Bohemian Rhapsody. I got about as far as the guitar solo and had to stop. There's just so much going on in this song, and it didn't seem fair to try and cram it all into one video. So today, I'm back to try to tackle the other half of the song, the half where things become truly bizarre. I've still got a lot of song to get through, so... Let's take it apart. When I listen to the opera section, the first thing that stands out is the intense vocal layering. Let's compare it to the other heavily harmonized part of the song, the intro. Is this the real life? Here, there's multiple parts, but they're all fairly close together, and they're all sung by the same person, so the whole thing blends so perfectly that it sort of becomes one complete voice. On the other hand, this... has a devil put aside for me! ...does not. The range is much wider, and while Freddie Mercury is still singing the middle parts, the lower voices are Brian May, and the high ones are Roger Taylor. Three singers with different vocal tones singing across multiple octaves means we're trading in the intimacy of the intro for something a lot more bombastic. It's less blended harmonies and more theatrical gang vocals. And when I say the layering is intense, I mean it. According to Roy Thomas Baker, the engineer, they spent three weeks recording just this section, with the three singers often spending 10 to 12 hours a day in the studio, and the final track includes 180 vocal overdubs. That's especially impressive when you consider that this was done in 1975. Back then, recording studios still ran on physical tape. The machines they had access to were limited to 24 tracks, which which also had to include all the other instruments for the rest of the song, so in order to fit everything in, Baker had to repeatedly mix the voices down, condensing them into just a couple final tracks. This process of repeatedly transferring parts from one tape to another physically degraded the sound, creating a subtle distortion that makes some of the larger voicings feel almost inhuman. Fortunately, the section includes a conversation with the devil, so that technological limitation wound up becoming a pretty useful feature. But there's more going on than just massive choirs. In lines like this, Galileo! 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 they play with the ranges and tones of their various singers to create a sense of conversation between different characters. Some of these character references are fairly obvious, like Galileo the Astronomer, while others are more obscure, like Scaramouche, a clown character from 16th century Commedia dell'arte performances. Sometimes they go entirely unnamed, and you're left to figure out from context what they represent, and even when you do know who a character is, it's still not all that clear what they're doing there. In the last video, I talked about how the song seems intentionally cryptic, designed to create a clear powerful narrative journey without ever telling you exactly what that narrative is, and this section is where that becomes the most obvious. These interactions between different characters help contribute to the operatic feel, selling you on the idea that this is a show, but the heavy use of metaphor and obscure references makes it hard to nail down exactly what the show is about. Another big factor here is the use of sudden dynamic shifts. Up to now, when the song has gotten louder or softer, it's done so gradually, using transitions to guide your ear to the new level, but here… No. None of that. They bring instruments in and out at random with no preparation or warning. They shift aggressively between different vocal textures so that even when the song gets quiet, you're still on edge because you just know it's about to get loud again. This creates a sense of panic and anxiety that grows as the section builds. There is a general trend upwards with the ending part sitting more on those fuller, louder sounds, but even there, the ground is unstable and it could shift at any moment. And then, of course, there's the tempo. Up to now, we've been playing a ballad at around 70 beats per minute, but as they transition into the opera section, they also start playing in double time. It's a related tempo, so it's not too jarring, but it gives the section a sort of bouncy excitement that heightens the impending drama, especially compared to the slow, deliberate sadness of the previous parts. A lot happens in the next minute or so, both narratively and musically, and the new tempo is the first step in creating space for that. I wanted to mention these things first because I think when you're analyzing music, it's easy to get caught up in notes and chords and to convince yourself that that's the real secret to musical complexity and interest, that what makes any given song great is the number of cool chords chords it has, but that's not true. Don't get me wrong, the opera section has some fascinating harmony, but when you hear this, I'm just a poor boy and nobody loves me. He's just a poor boy from a poor family. Are you really thinking, wow, what a cool chord progression? Probably not. I mean, 
maybe, I don't know you, but for me, that's just not what makes this work. That said, there are some harmonic ideas I do want to talk about, because they're still pretty interesting, and as a music theory YouTuber, I'm contractually obligated to never shut up about chords. If you watched my last video, you may remember that there was a specific moment from the intro that I told you to keep in mind. You forgot, didn't you? It's fine, I'll play it again. Easy come, easy go, little high, little low. It was an unusual bit of harmony that didn't really line up with the approach from the rest of the section. I said that was because it wasn't really from that section, it was borrowed from somewhere else, and it turns out it was borrowed from here. So what makes it so weird? Well, he's doing a thing called planing, where you just take a chord forcing and slide it around in half steps. In this case, he's sliding it up and down around a central B flat chord, alternating between resolving to it from above Easy come. and below Easy go. and he does literally the exact same thing in the the opera section even using the same words. Easy come, easy go, will you let me go? And it feels much more at home here. The section features lots of variations on this idea, including in the very first line. I see a little silhouette of a man. Here we see a similar shape with a target major triad, in this case A, that keeps getting resolved to every other beat. They still alternate between resolving to it from above and below, but this time, instead of sliding the whole chord around, they do it all over a consistent root. The bass stays on A the whole time, they just move the other two notes. When they're at rest, they're C sharp and E, making A major. When we want to approach from below, they become C and E flat, making A diminished. And when we want to approach from above, they're D and F sharp, which... Okay, admittedly, yes, this does look like a D chord. It's got D, F sharp, and A, and that's what D major is made of. But to my ears, this doesn't sound like a D chord. It still sounds like a kind of A chord. Specifically, it sounds like an auxiliary 6-4. This is an extremely classical sound from back when we had very different ideas about how chords worked, and it'd require a complete crash course in traditional European polyphony to really explain, but the basic idea is this. A major contains a root, a third, and a fifth. A6-4, on the other hand, contains a root, a fourth, and a sixth. Those two notes make it look like a D chord, and it sort of is, but because the A is in the bass, it's still also a sort of A chord as well. The 6-4 had a couple special uses, but the one we care about right now is the auxiliary 6-4, which was mostly used as decoration over the one chord. If you're familiar with sus chords, it's kinda like that, just with more moving parts. Point is, it's a way of resolving down to A major from another kind of A chord, which is exactly what we need in order to make this line work. They also sometimes play a slight variation on it, where instead of alternating between the 6-4 and the diminished, they start by playing the 6-4 twice, which largely serves to change up the melodic contour of the line, so it's not quite as predictable. And then there's this, where they double down on that idea, going from B-flat major to B-flat 6-4, and then continuing up to B-flat 7 before walking back down. All of these lines serve the same basic function. They create a sense of motion over static harmony. On a large scale, the chord isn't moving, but if we zoom in close, it's constantly pacing back and forth, building up this sense of static electricity that needs to be released in these big, sudden bursts of chord motion. Thunderbolt and lightning, very, very frightening me. That's three major triads a major third apart, creating three profoundly different tonal spaces before tying it off with a 5-1 resolution, and after all the tension we built up with those planning figures, it feels really good to actually go somewhere. Though the opera starts on A to create a sense of radical departure, it pretty quickly returns to the same B-flat and E-flat roots from the previous sections, so in the next moving line, this line from this monstrosity, we get a pretty clear classical resolution. As the section starts to wrap up, though, they do this cool bell chord on F-sharp 7, and then we get this. No, 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 no. If we include the F-sharp chord, this is four consecutive 5-1 resolutions. The first three go to various chords in B minor, another distant key, before suddenly jerking back to reality with a resolution to E-flat. Then we get another fairly straightforward progression in that key, has a devil put aside for me. ending with them hanging on the 5 chord for like four bars while Taylor builds up to that piercing high note. You know. This one. For me. Damn. I mean, as a music theorist, I could probably talk about timbral registration or whatever here, but as a fellow vocalist, I think I'm gonna stick with damn. That signals the beginning of the hard rock section, and the first thing to note here is that we have a new rhythmic feel. The band switches from straight eighths to a triplet groove, which you can hear very clearly in Taylor's lead up to the transition. <laughs> Thank you.
Once the section begins though, he takes things a step further and starts laying down a polyrhythm. In each bar, he plays four evenly spaced beats on the cymbal, but six on the kick drum, with the snare splitting the difference and emphasizing the backbeat. Here, check it out and try to track the different parts. In a polyrhythm, you typically have one part that feels like the dominant one, and thanks to the pronounced snares, I think that's pretty clearly the four cymbals. The kicks are more of a cross rhythm, there to complicate the pulse, but they get amplified by May, whose riff pretty clearly aligns with Taylor's kick pattern, as do Mercury's vocals. This elevates the cross rhythm to a more equivalent position, creating a level of rhythmic intensity that will carry throughout the rock section. The other big change here is the orchestration. This seems almost too obvious to be worth mentioning, but it's a huge deal, so I'm gonna do it anyway. The hard rock section is led by hard rock instruments. Mostly that's thundering drums and a screaming electric guitar. Now, we've heard these instruments in previous sections, but never as the primary driving force. Even in in the guitar solo, the guitar floated on top of the same piano part from the ballad. They were accents on top of a classical arrangement, like that clip of Ingve Malmsteen playing with a Japanese Philharmonic Orchestra. Is that a reference people get? I have no idea. Google it. Point is, up to now, while there have certainly been rock influences, they weren't what the song was about. Put simply, you couldn't headbang to it. Now, like many rock songs, the tonality here is kind of ambiguous. I think there's a good argument to be made that we're in the key of E flat. We start by resolving to that chord, then sitting on it for multiple bars. The section even ends by looping F minor and B flat, which seems like a really clear 2 5, setting up a resolution to 1. But as much as that makes sense on paper, it's not really what I'm hearing. The guitar lick seems to settle on B-flat, the melodic resolution to F sounds like it's landing on the fifth, Fit in my eye. the bass spends way more time on B-flat than E-flat, and this fill feels like a classic minor pentatonic blues lick, but the F doesn't belong to E-flat minor pentatonic. Also, well later in the section we get F minor, the first F chord we hear is major, which makes the intro read less like 1-2 and more like 4-5 to me. It's kind of like a harmonic magic trick. The resolution out of the opera section tells us pretty clearly we're in E-flat, but the change in style pushes my ear towards a more blues-based harmonic approach, subtly transforming it into B-flat mixolydian. That's just me, though. If you hear it in E-flat, cool. The main vocal melody here is a slow walk down from the flat 7 to the 4, so you think you can stone me and spit in my followed by a little slide back up. In each statement, he skips the downbeat, letting the band get in a big hit before he starts singing, and then he basically follows that quarter note triplet thing the guitar was doing. In fact, let's compare this to the guitar part. May was doing a fast walk up the scale, whereas Mercury is singing a slow walk down. It's a structural inversion of the riff responding to May's rising energy with a deliberate downward trajectory. It puts the two parts in conversation with each other, combining May's triumphant declarations with Mercury's abject defiance to create an attitude that is quintessentially rock. In terms of chords, the first couple lines follow the same pattern. They sit on B-flat for a bar and a half, then do two beats on E-flat for some chord motion. <laughs> This use of E-flat is kind of reminiscent of a quick change blues. In a traditional 12-bar blues pattern, you start with four bars of the one chord. That's a really long time, so the quick change pattern replaces the second bar with a brief visit to the four to keep things moving. Of course, this section isn't a 12-bar blues, and the E-flat isn't positioned in the right metric spot for a quick change anyway, but still, it's the same idea of breaking up a long run of the one chord with a relatively short four chord, kind of like the rock version of an auxiliary 6-4. That's another reason I like to think of this section in B-flat. The blues comparison doesn't really fit as well otherwise. After the E-flat, they go to some sort of color chord. The first time there's a quick return to B-flat, then D-flat. <laughs> These two chords are what's called chromatic medians, which means they're a third apart, but they don't share as many notes as you'd expect. B-flat had D-natural, well, D-flat obviously had D-flat, so the two notes clash. Or, well, it's a little tricky in this case, because May's playing power chords, but again, we have to consider the melody. Over the B-flat chord, Mercury starts on D, the note that's going to cause conflict, but then as the chord moves, he floats up to F, the one note these two chords agree on. The cross-relationship between the two kinds of D makes the chromatic median to bold, dramatic sound, and they emphasize that by changing the meter. The D-flat chord only gets half a bar, so it feels like it gets cut off by the start of the next line. The second time through, they use A-flat instead. 
which is a much smoother in-key sound, and they drop the extra half bar for a more comfortable meter. After that, we spend some time going back and forth between F minor and B flat, which again could definitely be viewed as a 2-5 in E flat. That's probably the most tempting part of the E flat analysis, so... Yeah, let's go with that. We've been bouncing back and forth between these two keys all song, so why not do it again here? I mean, they don't actually play an E-flat chord yet, and this could be explained in B-flat if we just read the F minor as like a soft five chord, so it's not like we've changed keys, but it sounds to me like we're working our way back. The hard rock section is also interesting to me because of how short it is. It's the climax of the song, that cathartic moment that gives all the meandering nonsense before it a clear destination. That makes it feel really important and memorable, and without it, the song wouldn't really make sense, but from the moment Taylor hits that high note to when Mercury sings the last line of the section is only about 30 seconds. I'm not sure I have any particularly meaningful insights about this, but so many rock songs really milk their climax for as long as possible, and I think it's neat that they had the confidence to just hit it once and move on. It already said everything it needed to say. After that, we get the most dramatic transition in the song, the culmination of all the walk-ups we've been hearing. This starts with May trading lines with himself on different guitar parts. <laughs> But then for the last one, Mercury takes over and plays it on his piano. It's such a smooth handoff that it's easy to miss how important it is, but this piano line is everything here. It's a changing of the guard, signaling the end of the rock section and the return of the classical instrumentation that defined most of the song. Through its walk-up, the piano rises like a phoenix out of May's electric guitar, marking the beginning of the end of the song. It's kind of a big deal. As for the walk-ups, there's a lot going on, but fortunately we can get a simplified version by looking back at Deacon's bass. Here, we see the basic structure. They have these little mini walk-ups, then a B, an A-flat, and finally a return to B-flat. Over top of these, May and Mercury are laying down full scales, but this is the skeleton they're fleshing out. These three long notes are doing a trick called encircling, where you set up a target note by playing the notes above and below it, so really, we're just working our way back to B-flat. Except, well... That B natural is a little weird, right? That's not in the key. Why not use C? I mean, that works, but I get why they didn't. Half-step motion feels stronger than whole-step motion, so when you're doing it in circling, it helps if at least one of the notes is a half-step away from your target. And while B isn't in B-flat mixolydian, the main scale we're using, if we call it C-flat instead, then it is in E-flat minor. Remember, we're working our way back to E-flat, so borrowing from that key's parallel minor scale makes sense. It also explains this G-flat at the start of the mini walk-ups, as well as the D-flat at the end. Of course, it doesn't explain these C naps, Naturals, but I like to think of those as providing a little mini encircling on the target C flat to avoid giving that note away before it was time. If you have another explanation though, let me know in the comments because this part is definitely pretty intricate. The other thing to note about the walk-ups is that they tend to end on interesting notes over the bass. Over the B chord, May hits E the fourth. On the A flat, he ends on B flat the ninth. And then for B flat, he ends on A flat the flat seven. It seems like the obvious choice would have been to end each of these on the octave to really outline the structure Deacon was laying down, but by ending on an unstable note instead, May prevents you from ever feeling like the line is complete. He keeps promising the next time you're gonna get a satisfying resolution, which Mercury finally delivers in his line, walking up B-flat mixolydian before resolving to E-flat just as the chord changes. This leads into the outro, where we're back to the original ballad tempo, and the major theme here is decay. They start with the full band, with May playing even more walk-ups to tie everything together, but then, one by one, the band members start to drop out. First, they lose the wall of sound elements, removing the layered guitars and background vocals. From there, May drops out entirely, and Taylor takes his final bow. Deacon fades softly into nothing, nothing really and we're left with just Mercury singing and playing piano by himself. At the very end, May comes back in with some soft ambient background lines, 
before all the tension in the song is finally released by Taylor's gong. I'm almost hesitant to talk about the harmony here, because again, I think it's way less important than the use of orchestration, but I do think it's interesting enough to be worth at least quickly addressing. It starts off by imitating the progression from the guitar solo, but as soon as we get to C minor, things change. Here we get multiple rapid-fire 5-1 resolutions that seem to imply that C minor is the one chord. We don't really stay there for long though, instead going to this... with another pair of 5-1 resolutions taking us back to E-flat, then G minor. This is reminiscent of that thing from the end of the opera section, where they just chained a bunch of 5-1s that pointed to different keys a third apart, so we never really had a firm grip on the tonality. After that we get this... which winds us back to E-flat via the IV chord. Overall, I think it makes the most sense to read this all in E-flat major. Most of the chords belong to that key, and the ones that don't can all be analyzed as secondary dominance, borrowed V chords that help set up temporary resolutions to other chords in the key. We start and end on E-flat, and they both feel resolved to me, so I'd say we're in that key, just with a lot of extra stuff happening in the middle. It's interesting, though, that with all those secondary dominants, we don't end on a primary dominant, instead using a softer plagal cadence, or or one resolution to gently drift back to our root. We're in E flat, but the progression is pointing us in every direction except home. That trend continues in the next bit. Which almost looks like a key change to C minor, but C just doesn't feel quite like home to my ears here. Instead, I think that sounds like an echo of the last bar. It's the same chords, but played without the roots, leaving us with a hollow minor tonality until we work our way back to E-flat. From here, he starts to walk the bass down while playing around with this figure, which is reminiscent of that thing he played all the way back in the ballad section. If you watch my last video, you'll know he used that as a way to set up a tension modulation, temporarily letting go of the original tonality in order to create enough dissonance that he could eventually resolve to a new key, and that's what he's doing here, working his way down to C, so he can turn that into a V chord and resolve it to our ultimate destination, F. He plays that descending figure one final time, And that's it. He's done. I think there's something poetic about this final key change. We've spent most of the song jumping back and forth between E-flat and B-flat, so ending in a brand new key feels like an escape, a final release for a troubled protagonist. If you subscribe to the Jacob Collier school of thought on tonality, then moving to a key with fewer flats represents brightness and happiness, and F major is the next key up from B-flat, so I like to think that whatever happened in this song, our narrator is finally at peace. And hey, thanks for watching, thanks to our Patreon patrons for making these videos possible, and extra special thanks to our featured patrons, Susan Jones, Jill Sundgaard, Duck, Howard Levine, Warren Hewitt, Kevin Willimowski, and Grant Aldonis. If you want to help out and help us pick the next song we analyze too, there's a link to our Patreon on screen now. Oh, and don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rockin'.